If you're able, please stand for the gospel lesson. I'm reading from Matthew's gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 18. We're skipping over the Lord's Prayer because we'll come back to that next week. But the themes before and after are sort of joined, and that's why I'm going to preach on, on these passages this morning. Listen for God's word to you. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees What is done in secret will reward you. And then skipping down to verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, Put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting but only to your Father who is in heaven. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Here ends the reading of God's word. This is his word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. A minister was walking down the street when he came upon a group of boys, all of them between the ages of 10 and 12 years of age. The group had surrounded a dog. Concerned lest the boys were hurting the dog, he went over and asked, what are you doing with that dog? One of the boys replied, this dog is just an old neighborhood stray. We all want him, but only one of us can take him home. So we've decided that whichever one of us can tell the biggest lie, he will get to keep the dog. Of course, the reverend was taken aback. You boys shouldn't be having a contest telling lies. He then launched into a 10-minute sermon against lying, beginning, don't you boys know it's a sin to lie, and ending with, "Why, when I was your age, I never told a lie. (laughs) There was a dead silence for a, a minute or two. Just as the reverend was beginning to think he had gotten through to them, the smallest boy gave a deep sigh and said, All right, Reverend, you get to keep the dog. (laughs) We're preaching today about hypocrisy, among other things. Let us pray. God of truth and love, thank you for always being honest with us. You often tell us what we do not want to hear. By your grace, we want to be honest with you and with each other, and although it is frightening to pray this, show us our hypocrisy. Forgive us for our selfish craving for the praise of other people. Help us to want only your praise in these sensitive areas of giving and praying and fasting. And help us to see practical ways to carry out these responsibilities 
in the sincere motive of love for you and others. And toward that end, come, Holy Spirit, and anoint this sermon. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you need to know a single word to remember this sermon, the word is character. Character. The word character almost never appears in the Bible. You won't find it very often in newspapers, and seldom you will hear it on television. Yet all of us know what it means, and every one of us will immediately recognize when it is absent in a person's life, character. Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, which includes Google as a verb, Webster defines character as follows. The aggregate of features and traits that form the apparent individual nature of some person or thing, moral or ethical quality. For example, he was a man of character. He had qualities of honesty and courage and integrity and good repute. Some people who never use the word character look around them at junior high promiscuity, busy abortion clinics, the current epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases, and they mourn the passing of morality in our society. They see elected officials taking bribes, business leaders demanding kickbacks, and investors parlaying inside information into untold wealth, and they lament the, de the demise of integrity. Or they read about battered wives, or jobless husbands and abused children, and they wonder what is happening to the concept of caring for each other. An anonymous writer once said, character is what we do when no one is looking. I like that. Character is what we do when no one is looking. It's not the same as reputation, what other people think of us. It is not the same as success or achievement. Character is not what we have done but who we are. And that's the theme of what Jesus is teaching here in the sixth chapter of Matthew as we continue our study on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus now poses several sets of apparent contradictions. It's what I call the double mandates of Jesus. At the opening of his sermon, he, ex he plainly commanded his followers, let your light so shine before men and women that they may see your good works. But here in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. In one place, he teaches, let your light shine. And then in these sentences of chapter 6, he says, keep it all a secret. Why does Jesus talk this way? Is this truly a contradiction? At first glance, it certainly appears to be. How can you let your light shine and do your good works to be seen by others? And at the same time, Jesus tells us to be careful not to do our acts of righteousness before others to be seen by them. It's a dilemma. But let me suggest another way of looking at this seemingly contradictory dilemma. In fact, not only did Jesus talk this way, he also demonstrated this in his own ministry. On the one side, he was the light of the world, and he said so more than once. Look at John 8, 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Or in John 9, 5, when he said, 
While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He says nearly the same thing in John 9, verses 35 and 36. Yet this same Jesus baffled his disciples on countless occasions by keeping his messianic mission a secret. It says in John 6, 14 and 15, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, the feeding of 5,000, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come, it says, and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Why does Jesus both talk and behave this way? Is it possible to connect both what Jesus says in chapter 5 with what he says here in chapter 6? In his commentary, John Stott says this, not conforming to the world is a familiar New Testament concept, but it is not so well known that Jesus also called us not to conform, get this, to the religious establishment. He saw and foresaw the worldliness of the nominal church and commanded the Christian community to be truly distinct from its life and practice. Stott then describes the situation where a friend that you invited to a Bible study declined to come by saying he or she finds Christian Bible studies full of hypocrites. And then he asked the question, what evidence is there that this is not true of the members of whatever group you are in? How many of us are hypocrites when it comes to what we say and what we do? Up to this point in the Sermon on the Mount, all of chapter 5, we've been examining how Jesus describes visible public righteousness how we are to live holy lives in public, made real in the everyday, nitty-gritty world of hate and lust, manipulation and retaliation. Now in chapter 6, we see what Jesus has to say about a secret, hidden righteousness. In Matthew 5, Jesus taught us that our good deeds, how we live our life, must be greater than the Pharisees. Because they obeyed the letter of the law, and Jesus wants our obedience to also include the heart, the intent, the purpose. And now in Matthew 6, Jesus draws the same two contrasts regarding our religion. He says that we should not be hypocritical like the Pharisees and not mechanical like the pagans. Either Jesus changed his mind in the middle of his message or else he purposely confronts us with a paradox. There was a right way and a wrong way to be visible about our faith in Christ. Here in today's text, he takes us below the surface of religious appearances and explores the interior of the soul. He wants us to distinguish between the artificial and the real in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. He wants us to be genuine, not counterfeit. Now, there are several reasons, as I see it, why Jesus tells us to do things in secret. It's what I call the secrecy mandate. The first reason is that Jesus wants you and me to experience good deeds, acts of righteousness, for our own sake, free from public interference. He wants us to discover the sheer joy in helping someone else. Whether it is giving some of our financial resources or some time and attention to someone or to share the knowledge, the wisdom, the skills and gifts that God has given us as we say in our mission statement. To put it simply, Jesus wants us to discover the sheer joy of going, uh, of giving without the hoopla of a press release. Look with me at verse 2, Matthew 6, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. 
I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. When it comes to giving and praying and fasting, Jesus called for a secret spirituality, an unconscious holiness. True piety means relating to our Heavenly Father personally without playing to an admiring audience. This is hard in a culture given to appearances and image and publicity and self-promotion. People seem preoccupied with giving the right impression and receiving the right affirmation. The issue is not between private and public spirituality, but performance-oriented religion versus a true personal commitment to Jesus Christ. For example, prayer is the act of relationship. When you pray to the Lord, it is a sincere interchange with the Lord who knows you and loves you, and you will discover at the very core of your being a relationship with him that will enable you to let your light shine before men and women in the marketplace. Praying in the secret place is to recharge your batteries for the public life each of us must live. The same is true for fasting, something we Protestants tend to know very little about, sadly. Fasting is to aid in our spiritual growth. Notice Jesus doesn't say here, if you fast. He says, but when you fast. He assumes that you and I will from time to time refrain from eating or refrain from some other activity to help us concentrate, to develop our inner lives, to help us deepen our focus on serving Christ. Fasting is to aid us in our spiritual growth. I have a good friend who every Lent gives up reading the sports pages. And he says, you know, the 20, 30 minutes that I normally devour those who won what, who's been drafted there, who lost, I'm going to spend that time in praying and just asking God to fill my life with his spirit. It's a great way to fast. Fasting will help us clarify our priorities and enable us to use the money thereby saved to aid the poor or some important cause. Jesus' command here is this. Your acts of discipline are between you and your Lord. And let me put it another way. Let the neighbor benefit from the healthy result of spiritual formation and growth within your life but as for the rigors of your journey toward that growth, don't mention it. Wash your face, Jesus says. The message, that, I think the message says, brush your teeth. Floss. <laughs> Jesus tells his disciples so that the people around you will not know of your hard work on their behalf. Just do it with joy. The second reason Jesus is telling us to develop a secret spiritual discipline, I think, is that Jesus enables us by this counsel to understand who we are as individuals in relationship with God. For a human being to be truly human, it is very important that he or she has a sense of the secret of the self. Character is what you do when no one is looking. I believe that Jesus is here honoring this inner mystery about what it means to be fully human. When we understand this, we will more completely understand what Jesus said in the first four Beatitudes, which is all about the inner road within. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Or a new translation says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope with less of you there is more of God and his rule in your life. You're blessed when you mourn, for they will be comforted. A modern translation says, you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. That's a journey that you and I can only experience in the inner being and in the soul. No one else can take that journey for you or for me. 
And Jesus recognizes that and honors that. It's found in that secret place where God himself embraces you and fills your life with his spirit to help you get through the valley of the shadow of death. Each of the first four Beatitudes is set within the most intimate part of our self-understanding. They are not words that express the rush of sensory stimulation from the crowd. In fact, let me dig a little deeper here. Throughout his ministry, our Lord was a revealer of what was hidden within selfhood. He respects the inner struggle and the self-discovery each of us are making, even as I preach this sermon. Look at how he got to the heart of the inner self of the Samaritan woman in John, the fourth chapter. It was the woman at the well. Jesus was in a deep conversation, really an interview with her, and he gently raised the question about her husband. Her life was suddenly on the table, and Jesus and she both spoke truthfully to each other. It's an amazing interchange. But notice, Jesus does not take away our freedom to decide the most important decisions by the sweep of his awesome authority, which could and would overwhelm our decision-making process. In fact, his authority is demonstrated precisely in the way he sets free those who accept the gift of salvation and his lordship, and even in the way he preserves the freedom of those who refuse his reign in their lives. The third reason that Jesus gives us the secrecy mandate, I think, is that it prepares us for the truly meaningful relationships with our neighbors. And I owe my thanks to Pastor Earl Palmer for helping me to understand that the Beatitudes proceed from the interior self-perception of mourning and meekness to the interpersonal and social result of mercy and peacekeeping. And I hope you will hear me when I say this. In the same way, the ethical challenge of the gospel always moves from the prior fact of our own personal sense of being loved by God toward the dynamic implication of let us love one another. That's when maturity begins in our faith. If your faith is still hung up on the personal salvation leg of the journey, then you are mostly concerned about your own salvation, and that's about all there is to this Christian thing. You are limiting and missing out one of the greatest joys there is to being a Christian. Kingdom living is so much more than just barely getting inside the gate. Jesus is here teaching us volumes about what a relationship with our Heavenly Father is all about and how it impacts our lives and how we live them. During my seminary days, I had the privilege of being on the staff of the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City under the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Bryant Kirkland, one of America's great, great preachers and pastors. I was so fortunate to have been selected to serve that pulpit. That's not a picture of him. That's a picture of Dr. Paul Turnier, because in the summer that I was on that staff in between my junior and senior years, the famous Swiss psychologist theologian preached for four consecutive Sundays. And I had the incredible fortune of being in the pulpit with him for all of those services and to spend some time with him during that month when he was guest preacher. Those were precious days. I had been reading his books in classes at Princeton, and here I was, relating to the master. In his book entitled Secrets, he wrote these words which bring into focus some of the psychological aspects of the theological point that I'm trying to make in my sermon this morning. He writes this, every human being needs secrecy in order to become himself or herself and no longer a member of his tribe in order to collect his thoughts. 
to respect the secrecy of whoever it may be, even your own child, is to respect one's individuality. To intrude upon his private life, to violate his secrecy, is to violate his individuality. But later in the same book, Turnier also writes this. So, therefore, in keeping a secret, if keeping a secret was the first step in the formation of the individual, telling it to a freely chosen confidant is going to constitute then the second step in the formation of the individual. He who cannot keep a secret is not free. But he who can never reveal it is not free either. Jesus has brilliantly drawn together both the need for the secret and the need for the opening, open sharing of our faith through lives of grace and authentic love. Both mandates are marks of a Christian style of life. And so the great challenge to each of us as we seek to live by the Sermon on the Mount is to do both at the same time and to follow the discernment of the Holy Spirit in the process. We are to give, we are to pray, we are to fast without regard for the appreciation or admiration of others. And at the same moment, we are to act as lampstands, as citadel cities with all the lights turned on so that our generation of wanderers lost and confused in the heavy fog may find the way to the source of love, namely the person of Jesus Christ. What Jesus has done by means of this double mandate in the Sermon on the Mount is to clarify for us these two mandates, though they appear to be contradictory, we really profoundly depend, are dependent upon each other. They go together, like love and marriage, as the song says. We should not act or speak too quickly. We should first be still in our journey of prayer, and we should practice quietly the spiritual lessons that we're learning. But we must not always sit quietly restrained by contemplation and secret prayer. There is a time to speak and there is a time to act. I began this sermon talking about character. Character is what we do and are when no one is looking. What about you? Who are you when no one is looking? When you're all alone, how do you spend your time? What do you think about most? Have you found the secret hiding place where you can communicate directly with your master, the Lord of the universe, the lover of your soul? I love that movie that came out a couple of years ago called The War Room. Remember that movie? The woman who had a little closet, and what strength, what power, what authority she developed in her life because of the time of secret prayer and meditation. Whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I hope you will see in the very act of this sacrament the double mandate the Lord has been teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. It is a personal, private act of worship, yes, but it is a public act as well. Paul points out, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that word proclaim is better translated declared or preached. You preach, you declare in your life the Lord's death until he comes. Whether we recognize it or not, every one of us is a preacher when we take communion. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32 to 33, whoever acknowledges me before men and women, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men and women, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. 
Jesus is not rejecting public piety. He is rejecting public hypocrisy. The falsely motivated acts that seeks to give glory to the actor rather than to God. Personal, private piety is fine, but it has to be public too, or it will not bring glory to God. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these tough words from your Sermon on the Mount. They are not easy to even understand and let alone live. All of us fall short. All of us say we do something and then we don't do it. So Lord, may you by your Holy Spirit convict each one of us to find that secret place in your presence to build character within us so that when we do go public, it's real. And people will see your face in ours. Let us be little Jesuses in the communities where we live, in our own families, in our work, in the university, wherever we may be. We want to be authentic, Lord, and real, as you are And it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen.